To glorify the Lord is the most glorious of activities because actually the Lord is glorified just by His existence. He's glorious. So today is Sri Ram Nami. And it's a day where we can deeply remember the pastimes, the glories, the activities, the qualities of Sri Ram. Out of all the manifestations of the Supreme Personality Godhead, Sri Ram is very much sought after, favored, very dear to the heart of many because he represents what idealism is in this world in terms of the most righteous personality, the most perfect husband, the most spotless of all characters when it comes to taking on the position of a, a ruler. Um, Krishna is a little bit different. It's not so easy to understand Krishna, or at least to what we say, apply what he does in our life. Ram is really teaching us what we should be like in all aspects of our existence. You can't follow Krishna. You don't have 16,108 lives. It's not what we say. Uh, Practical, feasible, and socially acceptable. <laughs> and, of course, what else does he do? He says one thing and does something different. <laughs> That's Krishna. So, people like him because he's a little easier to understand. <laughs> we, can, we can relate to him. And his glories uh, is, of course, his activities, but his character is exemplary. Perfect son also. When he was asked to leave the kingdom and go to the forest, although his request by his father was given in an unfair way by his stepmother, Kaikei. Yeah. Those of you who know the story, still, he obeyed his father without a hesitation. Yes, father, whatever you say. And this is Vedic culture also. Obedience to superiors. It's one of the qualities of what we say. Culture, and it's also the quality 
of success in life, to have honor for those who are in a superior position. Of course, a lot of times superiors are not honorable. Some things have been somewhat lost. But at least in the family, even if the parents are wrong, they're right. You <coughs> can say that. You know, if you follow your parents, because your parents always have your parents, unless they tell you don't worship Krishna, then you don't follow them. You don't work, don't engage in devotional service. That means that's something else. But in day-to-day -day life, they're worldly wise, and so they more or less know how to give us an understanding of how to live life. And we're still trying to experience life. They have already lived life. And they have many, many lessons that they can impart. So to honor parents, you know, Ram was doing that in a very exemplary way. Yeah, stepmother Kai Kei. She was influence. We were talking a little bit this, this morning about this particular point, how association with envious and motivated people can also cause us to develop what we saw the same you know, same tendencies. Kai Kei was a very Ram Ram's Father Dasara, he was the king of the world, powerful king, and he ruled one city called Ayodhya. Ayodhya was 90 square miles in land mass. Now that's a lot. Not 90 miles, 90 square miles. That means 90 miles in all directions. And all the citizens were obedient and very much cared for by King Dasarama. Uh, where do we find such leadership today? You don't. It's far from that. It's when. But that was, that's the nature of a Rajarsi. Mm -hmm. Rajarishi? We say Rajarsi. A Rajarishi. Rishi means say, great sage, and Raja means king. One who is a king, but also governed and motivated by of spiritual and religious principles, qualified to lead, not only from the material point of view, but also to show the goal of life, which is self-realization, and able to give the citizens the opportunities to achieve that in the, in the rule of the government. So, he had 350 wives. I know. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> well, but so to maintain, to make, to take care of one wife nowadays is difficult. Not to speak of 350. But he had a problem. All 350 wives were never able to produce a child. She was an anxiety about that. So he got the benediction of a great sage, whose name was Rishi Shringa, who came and did a puja. And by that puja, he produced this havasyana. And the, the results of that puja was this sweet rice that came from the sacrifice and was given to three of his principal's wives, Kakei, Kosalya, and uh, Sumitra. And from that came four illustrious personalities. He only wanted one great son so he could retire timely and have the, the kingdom go on in a spiritual way. But he got four. From Sumitra there was Lakshman and Sutrugna, and from Kaike there was Barton, from Koshaya there was Ram. These four personalities were manifestations of the chapter you have. And also known as the four symbols of Vishnu, but in the chapter of Yuha, there were Sankarsana, Aniruddha, Pradyumna, and of course Vasudev. And so they manifest in these four personalities known as Lakshman, Ram, Satruga, and Bharata. And out of the four, the most glorious and illustrious was Sri Ram himself. So much so that Dasrat didn't have any problem deciding who would be the next heir out of the four. Of course, they were all highly qualified. 
but Ram showed the most qualities. So he designated Ram, and Ram was the oldest, of course. As he appeared within the sacrifice, there was a sequence, and Ram was the oldest, so he was again considered to be the most senior. <coughs> um, but Kaikeyi had this maidservant, his name was, her name was Mantura, 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 not Mantura, Mantura. And she was the maidservant of Kaikeyi. Now, out of all the queens that the Dasrat had, Kaikeyi was his favorite. <coughs> He was like his special pet. She saved his life on the battlefield one time when he was in trouble. Uh, she got him off the battlefield to save his life, and at the same time she, she treated him in a medical way and healed his wounds. He was so overwhelmed with gratitude that he actually gave her a boon. The boon was, you could ask anything from me and I will grant it. He had that power. She said, I'll take it when the time comes, not now. He gave her two benedictions. And so, later on, when it was decided that Ram would take the throne after Dasarat leaves, of course, Dasarat was actually going to perform the ceremony the next day. It was already decided. Mantra influenced Kaikeyi in such a way that if she poisoned her mind and said, your son actually should be the king, and Ram, should, should not be the king, because if Ram becomes the king, your, your son will be, will be exploited by Ram, because he's envious of your son. Of course, this wasn't at all true in the slightest bit, but she spoke in such a convincing way. There are people who have that power, and even people who are evil, they know the art of speech, how to trick and what we say, create doubt within people's minds. So she did that. And Kai Kei decided, okay, maybe Mantura is right. So she said to her husband, I'll take the boons. And he said, what do you want? Band, band, uh, give, make Bart the king and put uh, Ram to the forest. He was just shocked, it was too much. In one sense, he could accept, all right, if Bart wants to be the king, but why send Ram to the forest? And she said, well, because if Bart's the king, Ram will become unhappy, and he will take action against Bart, so therefore he shouldn't be around. <laughs> and so, what to do? He, actually, he tried to dissuade her from her evil intentions, but it didn't work, because she had already said, you gave me a promise, you're a Kshatriya, you know Kshatriyas would rather die than break their promise. This is a real leader. A leader when they say something. Nowadays, you know, people say things, but you know, if the circumstances are different, what happens? You change your mind, right? I love you, but maybe not. <laughs> it's things if, if you don't really come up to the standard, my standard, then maybe things will change. You know? So people are not, what we say, as endowed with, what we say, solid spiritual qualities as years ago, because materialistic life is so strong nowadays that materialistic interest overshadows everything. People see things like that, so it's unfortunate, but that's the way things are. This is the age of Kali. Kali Yuga. Kali means lying, cheating, hypocrisy, quarrel. This is the age we live in. To find good qualities is very hard to find nowadays. Because by nature a person is of good qualities. Everyone has good qualities. In fact, that's all we have is good qualities. Everyone is good by nature. No one is bad because everyone is part and parcel of God. And God is pure and God is good. But our qualities become covered by this shadow of illusion, which kind of like takes a good quality and directs it in a bad way, a negative way. And that's Kali Yuga. People, instead of become eager to serve the Lord, they become eager for sense gratification. Eagerness is still there. So, Dasarath, he had to communicate that to Ram. He said, Ram, this is what 
And Ram said, yes, Father, I will do whatever you say. So he was ready to go to the forest. Lakshman said, if you're going, I'm going, because I cannot go without you. So Ram said, if you want to come, I will definitely be happy with your association. They were somewhat inseparable. But then Sita, Mother Sita said, you can't leave me here. I live only for your existence. We all know the story how Ram broke the most powerful of all bows in existence. This was Lord Shiva's bow. The, the ceremony of breaking the bow and how King Janak, in order to get find a perfect husband for his wife, for his daughter Sita Devi, set up this competition. And this was where he had this bow of Shiva that was given to him. And this bow was so powerful that you, it took 300 people to move it. They had it on a trolley where they could pull it. That's the only way they would move it. And, so they could. and his requirement, if you want Sita Devi for your wife, you have to not only be able to move it, you have to string it. So no one could do it. All the, even Ravana came to try it. And he couldn't pick up and He picked up the bow. He was the only one, one, one practically that could pick it up, but he couldn't string it. And Ravana was powerful. But when Sri Ram came, he, you know, he just like, you know, and everybody was watching with great intensity. He just strung it. And not only strung it, when he pulled it back, he pulled it back so far, it broke into three pieces. And the noise of the breaking of the bow was so tumultuous, the whole universe shook by the sound of it. And the bow broke and landed in three different places. So many miles away from the original spot. When Janak saw that, he said, <coughs> obviously you're, you're, you're meant for Sita. And so... Sita, you know, she gave her, even while the competition was going on, she fixed her mind solely on his lotus feet and was praying for him to do this. So when it came to Ram going to the forest, it was like death for Sita. A chaste woman cannot be without her qualified husband. She thinks that it's better to not be alive than to live without such a qualified husband. And so therefore she said, I'm going to the forest with you. He said, how will you live? The forest is cold. It's cold at night. It's dark. And there's no bedding there. You have to sleep on the hard, cold ground. And you're used to nice bedsteads and princely arrangements. Princess the arrangements, and there's nothing to eat. All you deserve roots and fruits and berries that grow on the tree, and you have to find them. And there are so many wild animals in the forest, and also the forest is inhabited by these rakshasas or man eaters. No place for a lady. He was determined not to let her go, out of his own concern for her. For him, it was no problem. She was just this 16-year-old girl who only knew luxury throughout her whole life. Her father was a great king, King John. And now she became under, in, under the care of another great king, Dasrav and his son. So she never knew austerity. She didn't even know how to spell the word. <laughs> It was like completely foreign from, but she was thinking this type of, of separation is worth the death. So she said something really powerful. She said, the forest, she said, Iodia, Iodia, the kingdom, without you is like the forest. And the forest with you is like Iodia. She said, I'm going. And so, everyone looked in amazement. And after, then they realized that she, there was no other way that she would continue her life. 
So the Ram said, okay, everyone gave their blessing. So they said, you have to wear tree bark in the forest. So they came with this tree bark outfit. And she tried to put it on. She couldn't figure out how to put on tree bark. It took a long time. And finally she did it. So what does this say? That nowadays we don't see such loyalty within the marriage. If there is some strain, sometimes the marriage relationships become weak. But here is the ideal example. That, and we can see from the other side how Ram protected her against so many difficulties. For him to live in the forest was nothing. The Rakshasas were no threat for him. The austerities were no threat for him. But for her, it was completely foreign to be in such an environment. So she was always in a predictable, I mean, in a difficult situation. But Ram had to get her out of these things. So he protected her through so many dangers and so many difficulties. And she stayed loyal to him. Here's an example. Some people, people say, you know, they try to make their marriage work. But the only way your marriage will work if you do adopt the qualities of Sita and Ram. See, a wife has to be like Sita, a man has to be like Ram. If one is there and the other one is there, it doesn't work. <laughs> but how do you do it in this age of Kali, when everything is up topsy-turvy and there's so, diff so many difficulties? So many. Therefore, one has to very go, go deeply into religious principles and adopt those things. Therefore, in, what, in understanding this particular pastime, we can see how deep that loving relationship is, that the husband will do anything to protect and care for his wife, and the wife will do anything to serve and stay faithful. When Sita was captured by Ravana, of course, Maya Sita, but when Sita was captured, she was in the Ashoka Grove, by, uh, the place of Ravana. You know, no one knew where she was. But finally, it was understood that she was in Lanka. So Hanuman found her. And then Hanuman, after seeing her, he said, Ram is thinking about you. He can only think about you. There's a beautiful cave somewhere. I'm not sure exactly where it's located. But in that cave, there is a deity of Ram. And, he, and he's got japa beads in one hand, and his, hand, his left hand is on his heart, lamenting for the disappearance of his wife when Ravana stole. So Ram, and this went on for four months. All he did was chant the names of Sita on his beads. And think of her, where is she? Of course, you might say the Supreme Personality of God knows everything. But in his leelas, he's acting in that mood. He actually doesn't know because his internal energy is yoga maya. He creates this relationship where he apparently acts and feels just like an ordinary person who was separated from his wife. So in that, in that, he's lamenting the disappearance or the loss of his wife. And she was only thinking about it. So when Hanuman came and said, I know where Ram is. And I can take you there. I'm powerful. You just jump on my back and I'll take you there immediately and then you'll be out of this predicament. She said, I can't do that. I can't touch another man. If I touch another man, I become unchaste. So her chastity or her faithfulness was of the utmost quality. Imagine if we had such relationships in this world today. Society would be quite nice. <laughs> but nowadays, you know, everyone is looking outside for something. But if we look deeply within our own hearts and practice devotional service, then we can <coughs> see what is the qualities that make life happy. And these are the qualities of spirituality which are the principles of civilized living. 
divorce uh, is something new within the world. It's only the last 50 or 60 years that divorce has become somewhat of a, a feature. I remember when I was growing up as a kid, I didn't know anybody who, in my friends, any of their mother and their fathers that were divorced. Nobody. And every girl in the class, except one that I can remember, was a virgin. <laughs> That's the way it was when I was going to school. Nobody was like getting into all this nonsense as young people. Nowadays it's just so loose. But in the last 60 years, with the advent of television and all this technology, the whole society has just become quite wild, you might say. But there, there was no divorce. The only new thing I knew about divorce was a TV program called Divorce Court, where they would show these examples of divorces. And it was a rare thing for a person to be divorced in those days. That was back in the 50s. But when the 60s came, things started to move in a different direction. And then the 70s, and then, of course, the 80s became hell. The 90s became uh, a hell within a hell. <laughs> and the 2000s, I don't know what you would call it. <laughs> you would say, Maha hell. <laughs> Society is thinking that the more you can do what you want, and the more irresponsible you become, the more you find happiness. But it's the other way around. The more you adopt religious and moral principles in your life, the more you find satisfaction and happiness, because that's the nature of the soul. And so, when we, when we hear about the pastimes of Rome, you really try to understand what is ideal life, what is dedication, what is commitment, what is righteousness, what is idea. He taught all these things in the most exemplary way. And how? You know, he went through such trouble to protect Sita. There's that one pastime, which is one of my favorite pastimes. When Ravana heard about Sita, he, his lust level went to, you know, like, all the way up to the top. And then Suparnaka and also Alambana. Alambana was one of the, was the general, one of the soldiers that wasn't killed by Ram in the big fight. He got away. 14,000 soldiers were killed. But both Suparnaka and Alambana talked to Ram and said, this woman will be the, what we say, the jewel or the flower of your harem. You must have her. So Ravana, when he heard the description of Sita, he was thinking, yes. And so, you know, he went to one of his former demoniac followers, who had retired from demoniac life. <laughs> his name was Maricha. <laughs> Maricha retired because he encountered Ram. He got knocked with an arrow by Ram 800 miles into the ocean. Somehow he survived. And after that, he was no longer, he, he just turned in his demoniac card and retired. He was on the unemployment line. <laughs> he just went to the forest and started to, you know, live in that way. But Ra, but Maricha was one of the best of all mystics. He had such powerful mystic uh, abilities that he could transform his form into anything in, a, in the most perfect exemplary way. <coughs> mystic power, one can get develop these powers in such a way that one can transform their form because the form is material. And if you know the art, you can adopt another material form. All of it is, it's meditation on the material energy in such a way that you manipulate the material energy to create something different. Mm -hmm. Mystic power is an art. Mm -hmm. Krishna speaks about mystic power in the Bhagavatam as one of the cities or one of the powers that one can develop. Then at the end he dismisses it and says it's just material. Mm -hmm. 
And so Mauricio could do that. So Ron came to Mauricio and said, I have a plan, you know. I'm really eager to acquire this Sita. So you help me. Mauricio said, I quit. He said, what do you want me to do? He said, who is this Sita? He said, and then when uh, uh, Ravana said, she, she is she is protected by this one Kshatri, and his name is Ram. Oh, Ram. <laughs> Don't even mention his name. Just the sound of his name was just too much for, for Maricha. He just lost it. He said, Don't ask. <laughs> Don't ask. You know. And, and uh, yeah, Ravana was just determined. He said, I need you. You're the one that can do it. Forget it. And then he told the whole story how he was knocked into the ocean and the whole thing. And Ravana wasn't so interested. But then Ravana said, You must do it. And if you do not do it, the result is I kill you. How do you do? <laughs> <laughs> nice. Not that you get fired, you get, you get destroyed. So Mauricio was thinking what to do. To be killed by Ravana or to be killed by Ra. Uh -huh. I think it's better to be killed by Ra. <laughs> that is his conclusion. Yeah. And so he just he said he had no choice. Really he had no choice. So he decided. So he took the form of this uh, uh, self-luminous deer that it had all these beautiful spots that were glowing like gems. And he was so attractive. Now, they were at Chitrakoot, and they had one year left in the forest. And so there was only one year left to go before the exile was over. So they were all there, and then all of a sudden, dee, 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 this deer comes from by. And Sita says, oh, Ram, look at that beautiful deer. Isn't it so nice? I never saw a deer like that in my life before. Let's get it and we'll bring it back to my yogi when we go back. Ram was looking. Lakshman said, I don't think that's a deer. <laughs> I know all 8,400,000 species and that's not one of them. <laughs> I think it's a demon. Oh, it's so oh, beautiful. Oh, there it goes, Ram. Get it, get it, get it. Hurry up. And she was persistent. You've always done what I wanted. Now you're not doing it. <laughs> she was gonna, you know, she was really attached. <laughs> so Ram said, all right, I will go. But I can't leave you here. It's dangerous. Lakshman, you stay here and you guard Sita. Don't let her out of your sight for a moment because there's so many Rakshastras. I mean, we've had so many problems in the past. This is my instruction. So he went and Maricha really ran fast as the deer. And so Ram had to go. And then while they were there, Maricha, you know, Ram finally realized that this, this, deer was just a demon. So he took out his arrow and, <laughs> and he finished it. And while Mauricio was hit with the arrow, he was dying and he called out, Lakshman, help! In the perfect sounding voice of Ram. What a crafty demon he was. <laughs> it mimicked Ram's voice so perfectly that when Lakshman heard it, and Sita heard it also. So Sita said to Lakshman, hey, your brother's in trouble, go. And Lakshman said, it's, there's no problem. He's never in trouble. He can handle himself. He doesn't need my help. Oh, no, he's, out, he's calling your name. Help. You should go. And then Lakshman was, he said, I have to stay here and guard you. She said, now I understand. All this time, you were just looking for the opportunity to be with me. Ooh, when that, when that Lakshman heard that, oh, that was too much. <laughs> she said, he never, in respect for Sita, he never looked at her directly. He would always look at her feet. 
a worshiper in here in that way. And now he was being accused for wanting Ram out of the way. So she was persistent. And he said, he said, all right. He was angry because he was really insulted. When you insult the Shatri, oh, it goes deep. You know, see what happened to Dhruva Maharaj. So he said, but I know if I leave, you won't be here. But I will give you protection, despite the fact that you insulted me. <laughs> so he took out his bow and he went and made a circle around him, which was like a view, huh? He said, he said, you stay inside this circle and nothing can harm you. Don't step out of it. And then, I, and then he left. So she was inside the circle, then Lakshman left. As soon as that happened, Ram came, and Ravana came, and he was in the disguise of a sannyasi. And he said, oh, Mataji, oh, that's a nice Mataji. <laughs> I'm so hungry. I've been traveling in the forest for days, and I haven't had anything to eat. I'm practically on the verge of death. Please give me something to eat. She said, oh, you poor sannyasi. Poor sannyasi. Yeah, there's no such thing as poor sannyasis. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in this guy. <laughs> she said, oh. She, of course, she had a compassionate heart. She was feeling for his suffering. She said, he, he, here, take this food. He said, oh, I, I, I can't even walk. I'm so weak. Please bring it to me. She said, I can't leave. I'm supposed to stay here to be protected. She, he said, oh, but I will die. It was good. Really a good actor, Robin. <laughs> and so she stepped out of the circle. And as soon as she did, <clears throat> she was vulnerable to be captured. And that's when Robin immediately took her, flew up into the sky and started to head towards Lanka. Of course, she was in anxiety. She dropped some of her jewelry during that time. And then Lakshman caught up to Ram. And Ram said, I told you not to leave Sita. Let's go. So they immediately went back. And then Ram's worst feelings were manifest. She's gone. What happened to her? He started chastising Lakshman. Now, what La had Lakshman had to go through? First of all, he's being chastised because he's following what he's supposed to do. And then, when he was doing that and she wasn't satisfied, now he's being chastised. So it says, in that incarnation, Lakshman, who is non different than Lord Balaram, he's coming from the Tattva of Balaram, Sankarsha. He was the younger brother. So he said, no more of this younger brother stuff. <laughs> so in the next two incarnations, which is Balaram and Lord Nityananda, he became older brother. <laughs> that way he could decide whether to listen or not. <laughs> and if he didn't, he wouldn't be breaking religious principles. <laughs> so, in that case, oh, Lakshman was so devastated now. And so in one sense he was being accused of Sita's disappearance. So they went to try to find Sita. Of course, there was, a, there was one bird, his name was Jitayu. This is a beautiful story. If you read the Ramayana, you should all read the Ramayana, but in this particular part, this is a very heart-rendering part of the Ramayana. Jitayu was seeing Sita Devi being taken by Ravana. Now, Chaitanya was old, and he was no match for Ravana. But although he wasn't any match for Ravana, he was thinking, I have to try to save Sita. So with all his might, he attacked Ravana. And it was a great fight. You know, he was no match for Ravana, because Ravana had all these powers, and he was young. But Chaitanya was just this old bird. And he fought so gallantly that he actually smashed Ravana's chariot to pieces and knocked Ravana down. But of course, Ravana at one point got up his sword and cut off both wings of Jatayu and left him in a bloody pool and then left. But it's explained in that beautiful story, how that fight was, that a devotee doesn't think in terms of, is my service difficult? 
or easy, and the devotee thinks it's my service, therefore I should do it. The consequences are up to the Lord. That was the, that's the message of that. that a devotee of the Lord is always thinking how to serve the Lord in the best possible way, not thinking so much what will happen to me, because they know Krishna will protect them. Ram will give them protection. And of course, later on, as when Ram, uh, Ram and Lakshman were looking all over for Sita, they came across Jatayu. He was practically on the verge. He was on the verge of death. There was nothing. He only had a few breaths left. And Ram said, "Ha! Ah, here's the person that stole Sita. He has devoured her. Now he's lying in his pool of blood." And so he took out an arrow. And then Jatayu spoke and said, "No, my lord, actually, it wasn't me. It was Ram, and I tried to stop him." And then Ram understood correctly. And he was so overwhelmed with compassion towards Jatayu that he perf he performed the funeral rites of Jatayu despite his anxiety about the loss of Sita. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. If you read the Ramayana, you will cry. How many of you like to cry? <laughs> it's healthy to cry. Ladies cry nicely. Men don't like to cry. <laughs> no, I can't cry. I'm <laughs> but you know, that's you know, this is like you men have this ego. Crying is for ladies, not for me. <laughs> but in this, these stories, and actually they're not stories; they're actually real life accounts of the Lord's Leelas, They enter deep into the mood of devotion, and they awaken with us in us real spiritual sentiments. <laughs> And so when Hanumanji hears the stories of the Ramayana, all he does is cry. Hanuman was a powerful warrior. He was a brahmachari too. And he cries. Because all he can think that... Uh, and why does he cry? Not so... Mm, because the Ramayana, you probably all... This, there was a particular play about after the disappearance of Ramana, uh, no, no, sorry, Sita and Ram, the story of their sons. But, you know, their sons never saw their father. And Sita never, Sita was, see, Sita gave birth in a distant place. How did that happen? After the battle of Lanka and Ravana was killed, you know, Sita was united with Ram again. Ram was thinking, you know, here I'm chased. You're touched by another man. Therefore, how can I accept you back? He said, you can go wherever you want to go. Oh, Sita's mind was, she was unhappy, but her mind was fixed. She was thinking, all right, after all that, and after all my loyalty and devotion to my beloved husband, now I'm being rejected. And Ram's, everyone, Lakshman, Han, uh, Sugriva, and Hanuman and others were just shocked. Why is Ram doing this? She remained faithful for all those ten months she was away. Ram didn't want to hear anything. No one could change Ram's mind. His mind was fixed. So Sita said, Lakshman, build a fire. Ram looked at Lakshman, do what she says. <laughs> so he built this fire. And then, when the fire was blazing, Sita offered her respects to her beloved husband and to all others. And without blinking an eye, she walked straight into that fire. And as soon as she walked into that fire, the fire just went whoosh, and died. And out of the fire came the, sun, the what is it? The fire god Agni with the real Sita, because the real Sita was never captured by Ravana. And this is important to understand for for great spiritual knowledge that materialists cannot touch spirituality. 
Ravana could not touch Sita, so therefore what he apparently captured was a false sense of Sita. It was called Maya Sita, not the real Sita. The real Sita was kept away from the whole scene during that time. So the real Sita wanted to prove her chastity, and she appeared with from the fire. And then by that, by that test of faithfulness, she came out and proved herself that she is, you know, chaste and faithful. And Ram accepted her back. Then everyone was so happy. They went to. There's another story I would like to tell, which is really. Ram Bhaktas really have deep love for Ram. And they, when they hear how Sita was captured by Ravana, their hearts break just by hearing this pastor. So there was one devotee of, of Ram, and he was living during the time of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And Lord Chaitanya came to his house, and he actually invited the Lord for Prashad. He said, my dear Lord, Come this afternoon and I will prepare for Shad. So the Lord came and he showed up right at Prashadam time. But nothing was happening. No cooking, nothing. And the Brahmin was there. The Lord said, You invited me for Prashadam. You didn't do anything. Where's the cook? He said, I'm sorry. When I think of how Ravana took Sita. It's, it's just my mind becomes so unhappy and I, I can't do anything. How is it possible Sita Devi could be touched by this? Yeah, Ravana. He was just like overwhelmed with disgust and unhappiness. The Lord actually, later on, you know, he pacified him in so many ways. He said, actually, it's not true. The real Sita was never touched. She was a Maya Sita. So he convinced him by his own power. But later, when, when Lord Chaitanya left, he found the scripture that describes this particular leela, and he turned all the way back after leaving for about three or four days on his travel. He reversed this just to come back and show his devotee, look, here's the scripture that explains that really, the real Sita was never touched by Ravana. And he was so happy. He was so happy. So... When they returned to Ayodhya, this is another point, and it's a little diversion from the theme, but I like this point. It just shows how, um, how a devotee should be grateful for whatever anyone does to them. Gratefulness is a quality that makes devotional life, what we say, happy. When you're grateful, for whatever God has given you, whatever the devotees have given Gratefulness is a sign of a, a real, genuine quality within a person. When a person is thankful, we take advantage of each other. But a person by, who is a good, understands, they're grateful. So at the end, when everyone came to back to Ayodhya, it was a big celebration. The whole city came out. And Ram's mothers were there. Dasrat had left the world. In despair, the Brahms mothers were there, and Vishwamitra no, Muni was there, and all the great sages, and they welcomed. It was a grand celebration. And everyone was so happy, and then Sita was thinking, you know, it is because of Hanuman that I have been united again with my beloved. So I want to give something to Hanuman to show my appreciation. She had to see a special necklace that Ram had given her that she was wearing. And she took off the necklace thinking, I want to give this to Hanuman just to show my appreciation. So she wasn't sure if she did it. She could do it. She looked at Ram and he nodded in, in he acknowledged it. And she took it and she gave it to Hanuman. And Hanuman was very happy. So this shows that although, you know, Hanuman did his duty, but he went beyond his duty in the sense that he, you know, and because of that, both Sita and Ram are again united. 
So everyone was back, and then and then he was. Then it was a big ceremony, and Ram was in, in, installed on the throne, leader of the Ayodhya. The, all the citizens were happy, and life was going on. And but Ram, as the ideal king, he would go traveling throughout the kingdom, just in disguise. Or sometimes he would send some of his, you know, his men to go in disguise to see what the people were saying, to hear what they were saying about his rule. Because it says that a king should be above suspicion. If there's anything wrong with the king's rule, then a righteous king will rectify that. So one day he went in disguise, and while he was walking, he heard this man speaking quite loudly, and he was chastising his wife. He said, I don't know where you went last night. You were gone the whole night, and now you're back, and you want me to come in, and you want me to accept you again? You're unchaste. You are staying at a house of another person. How can I do such a thing? I follow religious principles. I'm not like Ra Ram, who takes Sita back, although she was with another. Oh, when Ram heard that, he was so unhappy. Ah, I'm being criticized now for taking back Sita. He was thinking, this is not good. Of course, that person was wrong, but he was still thinking, I should follow this. And then he said to Lakshman, the next day, he said, you know, I think it's a good idea if Sita goes on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a nice place, it's called Valmiki Muni's Ashram. <laughs> and she was pregnant at the time. And so Lakshman was thinking, oh, here's another one of these things I don't want to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's one another reason why he became older brother. Because, <laughs> you know, being, being in a younger brother situation, he had to follow whatever Ram, and I, Ram, whatever Ram said. And so he said, Ram said, you take her by chariot to Valmiki Muni's Ashram and don't tell her why. Just say we're going on a little tour. And so she agreed and they were in the chariot and Lakshman was holding the reins and he was riding along. And then Sita, she was sensing something is not right. And she said to Lakshman, Lakshman, I can see you're not happy. What's wrong? Oh, where are you ta you're taking? Oh, I'm not coming back. Ram is sending me away. And Lakshman couldn't say anything because his emotions, his happiness was to see Sita and Ram together. Here's another amazing quality. We become happy when we see other people happy. And we become unhappy when we see other people unhappy. Srimad Bhagavatam mentions that. And even when we see how people are suffering, it causes us a sense of unhappiness. And that motivates one to try to make a, a person happy. And when we see another person happy, we, think we feel a sense of happiness or so. That's, that's the quality of a devotee. That's the quality of a civilized person. The opposite is when you're someone's unhappy, I feel happy because I'm miserable anyway. And because I see how miserable you are, I feel better. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's good. yeah, right? If you think, oh, someone else is suffering more than I am, it's not so bad. <laughs> and then the other way, if you see somebody happy, oh, how can they be happy? It's not real. It's, it's false. So we become unhappy. But that's, that, is, that is not a desirable way to be. So one always thinks how to make others happy by relieving their unhappiness. This is, this is Vaishnava. So, of course, this was the Lord's pastime. And then Sita was left there. And then later on, she disappeared into the earth. I think that was the point. Yeah. And then again, they were united, reunited again in the spiritual world. So when Hanuman hears this story of the Ramayana, and he does regularly, all he can do is feel unhappy. It's sad. It's sad in that sense. The Lord's pastimes are meant to invoke a type of emotion that creates a certain longing within our heart for devotional life. 
um, this is a, there are so many wonderful pastimes within this greater pastimes. So the life of Ram is glorious, and his appearance is meant to teach us so many important principles on how to live life in such a way that we can find satisfaction, happiness, and spiritual attainment in that. So, of course, we should read these pastimes, we should hear them over again. Because the more we hear about these things, and the more we, we become, what we say, absorbed, the more we lose all negativity. Because simply by hearing the pastimes of the Lord, Speaking the pastimes of the Lord, remembering the pastimes of the Lord, means that we are attaining spiritual consciousness. Because the Lord's pastimes, although apparently seems to be somewhat ordinary in many ways, are not. They're not ordinary. Because the Lord performs these leelas for his own pleasure and for the upliftment of all conditioned souls. So today is a very glorious day. I hear we are in the city and Ram is in the forest, right? He's in Bhaktivedanta <laughs> Manor. So we're, we're waiting him to come back to, this, to Iodia here. <laughs> but I think he'll come back when we turn London to Iodia, not before that. <laughs> Anyway, thank you very much for your attention. Are there any questions? Yes. Why do you Why why do people judge her? In Oh, she wasn't pure. <laughs> that person who said that was wrong. She was always pure. The criticism of her being impure is all wrong. And they don't know. She was always faithful. She was. She was. She was faithful. But we don't listen to some people. <laughs> you know, you don't take wrong as right. <laughs> yeah, it's not. That same person, that same person who accused Sita and, and Ram of Ram of being, later on he appeared in Krishna Leela as the person who was Thomas Taylor, who, when Krishna and Balaram came into Mathura and they saw these clothes, and, they, and then he asked, they asked about that, and they said, this, Does these clothes belong to King Kamsa, not for you, by even looking at these clothes. So then Krishna just cut off his head. It's the same guy <laughs> who appeared again. So you've, you've, Whoever says Sita was impure is wrong, 100%, because they don't know the story. So don't listen to the wrong people. Yeah, she wasn't, not at all. Devotees don't think like that. I know, they don't. <laughs> Devotees don't think their Sita was never yeah. But that's the Ramaya, so what can you do? <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Please, Maharaj, could you explain the uh, <coughs> relationship between Vedavuti and Ramaya Yeah, the Maya Sita. The story is mentioned in the very beginning of the Ramaya. For Ram, Ravana was traveling around, and he came to the forest. And in the forest, he saw this lady 
who was meditating. And then he came closer and he realized she's like a sadhu. She had long matted hair and she was sitting on the rock in deep meditation. And then he was thinking, how is a lady alone in the forest by herself? There's no protectors, there's no husband, nothing. So then he went closer and then he saw that she was really very physically attractive. So he started to speak to her. Her name was Vega Vati. She had been performing austerities for so many years and her goal was to get Vishnu as her husband. So Ravana, he kind of forced himself on her. And then she refused and then he grabbed her by the hair. And when he did that, she had mystic power. So she cut, she took, she created a knife that cut her hair right where he grabbed it and he just fell back. And all he had was her hair. And then she looked at him in a very angry way and she said, You have touched me. I have become impure by your touch. Therefore, my body is no longer worth living in. And as soon as she said that, she meditated deeply and she created the mystic fire. And she raised the fire element within her own body, which yogis can do that. And she burnt herself to ashes. And so that same personality who had been meditating to get the Lord as her husband became the, seat, the Maya Sita in that pastime. Because in that pastime, the Lord could only have one wife. But he allowed Vegavati to play that particular role in order to satisfy her desires. So that's the story like that. Let's mention the very beginning of the Maya. Her desire was to get the Lord as her husband, and so it did happen, but in a different way. Anything else? Any other questions? Yes? Apparently. Sita was separated from Brahm, and the children were born and never saw their father later criticized their father for what he did to their mother. <laughs> yeah, apparently it happened. But in the material world, there's one thing it teaches you. In the material world, you can expect everything to end unhappy. <laughs> right? In the material world, happiness is just another form of unhappiness. And unhappiness is really all there is. What is the un why is material happiness another form of unhappiness? Because it just leads to unhappiness. That's why. So real happiness is on the spiritual part. Material happiness is just a little bit better than material unhappiness. That's which leads to another form of unhappiness. That's why. So the Lord's pastimes invoke a type of sentiment where we can learn about material life and at the same time become more and more attached to God. So the more we hear these pastimes, the more we develop attachment. For what? To go back home, back to Godhead, not to stay in this material world. Anything else? Okay. Yes. Why did Lakshmana disobey Rama and left Sita alone when he went to catch her? He disobeyed her? Rama? Sorry, Lakshmana disobeyed Rama because he told Rama for Lakshmana. Don't leave Sita alone. Oh. Oh, that part when she was. Hmm. Yeah. That's a tough one. <laughs> but I, I, he, he was insulted she really insulted him he wanted to prove to her that what she was saying was not true she was accusing him of wanting her and this was not only untrue it was the furthest thing from the truth he only worshipped her and honored her and it says it says in the remind he never even looked at her he only looked at her feet 
So when she started to speak in these very, what we say, accusing terms, he was, his heart was being pierced by these arrows. So in that sense, he was just, all right, if that's what you say, I will go. And then, so it was difficult for him. That's why he never became younger brother anymore. <laughs> it's really tough for Lakshman. You should really pour your hat out for Lakshman. He had a love service. Jai Sisi Raha, Vandalishwar Kija.